Alrighty, everyone. Let me center myself in my frame, like always. Uh, we are back for this week's episode of the Designer's Den, and I am excited and peaky as always. Let me turn my game down there. Uh, and I'm very excited this week to have on as my guest Richard August. Uh, Richard is with Steamforged Games and uh, lead designer on, I don't know, a lot of stuff over there, pretty much everything it looks like. Um, yeah. And uh, we're going to talk today about the upcoming um dark souls rpg um and i'm super excited for it so um but before we get into that i'm gonna let richard introduce himself a little bit more uh tell us a little bit about yourself how you got into the industry and you know how to end up here i mean not uh, here a, but you know <laughs> <laughs> that's um that's a good question so i i, I started gaming very young because in in the uk we have games workshops pretty much on every street corner so you know I, I do know it was we were uh, sorry an inter interject here visited London with my mom we don't we've never traveled overseas before and that was one of the first things in London she pointed out to me look a nerd store yeah and it's I think <laughs> in the UK we're very lucky like that because you know they're really big inviting places and until recently uh, nerd stores definitely weren't that I don't think they were kind of you know crowded windows full of boxes and stuff and it was kind of intriguing but but not immediately kind of not inviting right? yeah definitely not whereas games workshops definitely are big bright letters everything glowing and bright and everything so uh, i got in like that and then i was really bad at the painting and and the person <laughs> who ran the <laughs> dreadful at the modeling the person who ran the games workshop club at my school says well have you tried dungeons and dragons and it very quickly became clear that all you needed to play dungeons and dragons was books well i already loved that pen and paper and you didn't have to paint anything no. so i was games workshop immediately died for me and i've been role playing pretty much ever since um and i did and, and then I, you know at a certain point i thought oh maybe I'll, I'll try writing for some things and and it went from there and i was uh, a few years later i'd kind of been freelancing for about three and a half years and a, a steamforge games was genuinely 10 10 minutes drive around the corner from me uh, and a, a job came up for a game designer there. I, I went along. I didn't get the job that time. Right. Because obviously Steamforge was best known at the time for um, board games. Board games. And I, you know, I'm not a board game designer by any means. And it's a, a really... I, and they're very different. Hugely different skill set. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, you know, I, I work with some amazing people who, who are fantastic at that, but I couldn't do it. But genuinely the next day, um, the owner said... Uh, we, we're moving into RPGs, and the person who'd interviewed me, Jamie Perkins, said, I've got somebody for you to meet. So I got invited in, and, and uh, you know, it's one of those kind of um, very, very fortunate situations. So that's that's how I got here okay. talking to you. Well, at first, I was going to say your story was very different from everyone else, and that it seemed like you sought it out intentionally, but it does seem like, in actuality, your story is very similar to everyone else. You were in the wrong, or the right place in this case, at the right time. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, and then... Um, and then you weren't able to say no, and you know, and so forth and so on. And we still don't know how to say no, and so you just take on more work until <laughs> endless, endless work. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's the nature of this industry. Oh yeah, no, definitely. Um, being able to say no is a very important skill set in this industry. Otherwise, you will end up with too much work, and you will burn out, and then you will miss out on the project that you will be most excited about in your life, and you'll be very sad at yourself. Um. These are the very, very wise words <laughs> for anybody listening. Uh, that, yeah, but yeah, learning to say no to the small thing because you've got the big thing, you know, you're thinking about the big thing ahead or you've got your own plans is, yeah, hugely important. Yes. And you got to save time for uh, even the small projects that are important to you, um, by which I mean to say, um, Mom, I love you and I haven't forgotten about our project, okay? I'm working on it. <laughs> uh, are you writing an RPG with your mom? Yeah, my, my mom and I are, are working on a couple of small um, projects. Uh, so we're writing a couple of books, supplements. So um, the one we're working on right now is a quest book. So a book of prompts for like um, either new, aimed at new DMs, but you know, or for any DM who's just like, I just can't feel, I don't feel like thinking tonight. Let me just pluck something and we'll play it. Um, and then a couple of other supplements to go along with it. They're all based around her D&D &D character, so these are, you know, quests that 
uh, either, you know, he's done stuff like this before, or some friends of his need help, and he's just too busy, so can you help them? And then we've got NPCs, um, perfectly legitimate job occupations you can take. They're not legitimate. <laughs> They're all covers. <laughs> nice. And then, um, and then the final one is, um, you know, magic items and other miscellaneous stuff. So we're putting all those together eventually. Um, right I now, have to, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to derail this. No, no, you're good. I have to. I have to ask: Are you then a second generation gamer, or did you get your mum into you? Right. Okay. I got my mum into it. Um, she is, um, t I, you know, uh, the best. Um, actually, mom just came to her first D and D convention. Um, not last weekend. Weekend before, uh, in awesome. Winter Fantasy, she came to. Uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, and joined us for a couple of days of winter fantasy. Um, we didn't end up playing any D and D just because the scheduling didn't work out. But we played a bunch of board games and um, watched some people play D and D for a bit. And she sat in on all my meetings with me, <laughs> so she's now contributing to the behind the scenes stuff as well. We're having oh, a fantastic. we're having a community meeting for Baldwin Games about you know some of the stuff going forward in the future, and we're all discussing it and everything. And she's like, if I could just chime in from the peanut gallery, I have some opinions over here from an outsider, which is probably important to this. It feels like and we're all like, yeah, no, go. And she starts talking, and we're all like, actually, yeah, that's very good. Let's write that down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so definitely, wow. I've definitely have you know drug her into all of this, but um, she she loves it. She's you know. Uh, very supportive, and if her children love it, then it's obviously important enough for her to at least try it. Um, yeah, no, fair enough. I managed. I, I've just about managed to get my mum to play one board game, but yeah, it's not. It's not. It's not going to take hold long term. <laughs> Definitely not. It's a. It's a one and done. Yeah, and I mean it's easy. Um, for my sister, she's opened a bakery, so that one's the, that one's an easy one. Go bake mm. together. Got it. Yeah. Done. Good. Um, and then for my brother, um, he's um. You know, we're from the southern U.S., so he's into, like, all the, the off-roading, the mudding, the working on cars, and um, building things, and fixing things, and tearing things down, which is equally useful as fun. Useful skills. Um, yeah, useful skills. So she goes, yeah, and, yeah. so he does that, that's his job, so she goes and helps him with, like, demolitions, and picking up old cars, and this, that, and the other. She's great. Awesome. Um, but yeah, um, you know, so speaking of, you know, family let's switch gears speaking of games that you probably aren't going to play with your family uh dark souls um not because it's not necessarily a good game for the family but uh the, the video game itself isn't typically multiplayer it's a single player game and um well you, you you've been more immersed in it recently uh, what, what, what's the summary of dark souls that you would give to someone who's never played it Dark, so Dark Souls is a game of strategic <laughs> battles in a forlorn and forsaken fantasy world. And yeah, you, you are uh, alone. You are consistently sort of uh, outmatched by the enemies you're, you're fighting, you know, some of whom have ludicrous powers. And basically the idea is you kind of bit by bit win your way through to be faced by uh, difficult choices about how you affect the world, really. And I think it's um, I don't you know, think, a famously yeah. difficult game. Yes, uh, it is so famously difficult um, that the most commonly seen scene in the entire game is the screen that simply says, you died. It is indeed, which is why it's the first page which was okay. perfect. Uh, I I opened the book when you sent it to me, and I started cackling, which brought Alan over here, and he saw the front page of the book before he'd gotten it in his email, and was just like dying. He's like, "That's per that's exactly how you start this," because um, it is. It is it's a very difficult game. Um, you know, it it you know brings to mind like a lot of the more. Um, I don't know, they're very popular lately, it seems, like all of these games that have come out that are very difficult, the new the new Metroid game, um, mm -hmm. Hades, they're all meant to be very, like, punishing. 
um, you you die over and over and over and over again until you 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 know you learn the lesson, you figure out the objective, you get the power, you get the the whatever which propels you on, or you make the you know the moral choice to betray someone in game, which gives you the power, um, which propels you onwards towards the end, where victory may or may not seem that victorious. And I think that's one of the things that I think connects like those games there to the typical Dark Souls experience. Um, the other game that I really related to in my mind is one that I put a lot of hours into personally. Um, well, the whole franchise, uh, Diablo, uh, where you're you're going and you know you're the hero. Maybe Ish. you feel like the hero. You think you're the hero, and you, you know you're battling all these unknowable terrors, and you know it's like you're going through it, and you're like, I don't know why I'm here doing this alone, but yet you are. No one else is doing it that you know of, so kind of got to press on. Um, but Dark Souls itself is known for being, you know, one of the most punishing series out there. Um, other people liken it to um, Bloodborne or um, all of a sudden I am blanking on the name of every single game that uh, my hander just published that was their inspiration. <laughs> they had was, a... yeah, Sek Sekiro, I think, is it was on their list and that's definitely a soul, Souls-like game. Yeah. And... Um, Demon Souls. Yeah, it's Demon Souls. Um going going back even further like old school other rpgs um where you know you're 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 out there and you're doing it and it's just you um so you know obviously dark souls is a is an ip that steamforge has had for a while as a board game um so you know it was kind of i don't know obvious i guess to me probably to you all as well that you know it's a very popular um ip and there's no tabletop RPG, so. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it does, I mean, when you say we did have the board game license, it was not as um, as easy a sell initially as, as you might have thought. Oh, no. Uh, we had to keep uh, Matt, who is the, the, the chief uh, creative officer and, and my co-designer on the game. We had to keep pushing for it and pushing for it until we finally, you know, got the, the green light to make it. Um, but I'm glad, I'm glad we did. You know, I think... There are, you know, Souls, the Dark Souls, Souls-like games, you know, have kind of influenced um, RPG, tabletop RPGs. Because, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's a lot of back and forth because um, Hidetaka Miyazaki, who's kind of the, the director behind Dark Souls and everything, uh, is a big, I think he played D&D &D and he played RuneQuest and he's a, he's a big Big RPG. into RuneQuest, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so there's, you know, there, there's that constant kind of um, reciprocal relationship between the two he's borrowing ideas from rpgs and then rpgs borrows them from dark souls and so um you know there's some like um rune can by uh colin colin lasur is, is a really good uh light dark souls-esque game set in a kind of vamp uh, uh, vampire viking norse setting um that uses bonfires in a similar way but what there wasn't was a full-on attempt to translate the Dark Souls world into a fully realized, playable from you know uh, detailed game, right? And that's what we wanted to do. Yeah, and to have something you know, an RPG is typically very open world. You can go, you can you know do the thing, you can make your mark on it. You can be your own kind of character. You know, uh, very much like like the games you know you're going along you're you're leveling up you're gaining powers as you go so like not a perfect fit which especially if you go on twitter uh you'll get lots of opinions there um about how good or not good of a fit this game will be um from people who have yet to have the games in their hand by the way just want to <laughs> let everyone know my opinion on twitter's opinions on this <laughs> um but uh you know in general though yes like something like this like I don't know. I almost feel like it's a it's a better fit as a, an RPG than as a board game. Although you know, I don't know. We've got all these board games, zombie board games, especially are very popular. Where like dying over and over again, <laughs> <laughs> it's a thing. You die, you get a thing. You you die more times, you get another thing. You die too many times, well, 
that now you got it. <laughs> now, now you're out. Um, you know, but survival games, like they're they're a thing, and it's not technically a survival game, but it kind of ends up being one. A, yeah, I think there's a lot of crossover because I mean, you know, Death in Dark Souls is is such a major part because it's about learning and gaining new insight into the challenges ahead. You know, you you get basically as far as your skill at the time allows you to get, as far as your patience allows you to get. Um, and I do hope we've captured some of that in the in the tabletop RPG. I think, you know, because I mean we've introduced a couple of, of new mechanics in an attempt to to more, you know, accurately model the way Dark Souls um games work, which do mean that you have to to consider your tactics in a way 5e because yeah spoiler for anybody who's not aware we, we're using the 5e engine as a as a basis doesn't require i think it's very it's quite easy in in 5e to come up with a a, a functional strategy which you can use against almost anything fighter stands at the front wizard stands at the back you've got a lot you know maybe you've got your cleric in the middle paladin guarding the wizard etc you know uh, you the can, paladin can... standing no more than 30 feet away from anybody yeah <laughs> to make sure you can do bless and all that kind of stuff so um what we wanted to do is is get away from that where there isn't a single you know uh ideal kind of party lineup marching order etc you are going to have to change constantly mm -hmm. and the monsters are not going to attack you in the same way you can't just you can't ever be comfortable with what you're up against um and and hopefully that's what we've done and i think with a lot of the changes that you've put into it so like i said it is based on the the 5e chassis um so it's very familiar feeling to all of the millions of fans of 5e out there um which makes it very relatable very easy to pick up but you've done an excellent job like i don't even want to say convert ad adapting um some of the elements to make it very dark soul feeling like so you've also got um for people maybe not as familiar with the game uh, a whole section on you know some of the lore there um and so much beautiful artwork throughout mm. the book like absolutely breathtaking um that's actually probably going to be one of the first things people notice when they open the book is just how beautiful it is um, especially people who, <laughs> who, who get the gold edged pages for the collector's edition. Uh, that just, it just, it's, it's just, just extra enough to where I was like, do I need that? I don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> but they're edged in gold. Yeah, um, it is pretty, it's pretty beautiful. It is. There's just something about gilt edged pages where it's just like the little, the little goblin brain in me is like, but it's gold you and you and me both because when they asked me what so what would you what would make this you know a collector's edition i was like the first thing i said was gilt edged we got it. everything has to be gilt edged <laughs> if it can have gold on it i want gold on it i've got a gilt edge uh leather bound copy of uh, the hitchhiker's guide like the whole anthology oh, nice. and and like i got it like on clearance at like barnes and noble <laughs> more years ago than I want to think about but it's just like <laughs> it's moved everywhere with me like I've downsized so many books like, you want to get rid of this one I'm like no it's got gold pages gold is gold edged <laughs> everyone's like is this book very special it's got gold pages look at it look at it yeah exactly um but you know all the beautiful artwork and lore and everything and then uh the entire chapter for the DM kindling the flames on building that authentic Dark Souls experience. And I think, you know, that's going to be really important for people who are, I don't know, who haven't invested hundreds of hours into this game. Uh, like myself, I've invested maybe 100 hours. Um, I know, I know. I, I spent too much of my college career investing hundreds of hours in World of Warcraft instead. Uh, dying over and over again to the same raid boss. <laughs> the same thing, right? No. I mean, it's, I mean, it's not. It's not dissimilar. <laughs> I think you know, it's a similar mindset. I'm sure you could translate it to Dark Souls if you wanted. I mean, probably, probably. But, um, but yeah. So you know, obviously, things that we've got in here. Um, it is a fully self-contained game. You do not yeah. need any other books. 
Nope. You need none of the. It, it's everything. Everything you need to play is in there. Yeah. Yes. Um. And that's everything you need to play, even if you don't know how to play a fifth edition already. All the core rules are in here that you need, and they're very way very well laid out um, in such a way that you know you're going through them in the order that you would logically need to learn them. I loved that just to start. And then you've got you know your more Dark Souls specific classes. So you know, um, and I don't know of the classes were there ones that you were more excited to bring to this. Um. So, um, the, I, I was, I was quite glad we got to do the deprived just because, um, I, I think the deprived is very funny. Um, it's, um, you know, just, just to, to create a game and then have so many people deliberately choosing to make lives hard, life hard for themselves. I think, I think that speaks to what a great game Dark Souls is to the masochism of a lot of Dark Souls players. <laughs> And I find that very funny. So I, I really want, I, I was desperate to keep them in it. Um, and I think it also allows, doing something like that allows you to be a lot a lot more free with what you can let that class do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think if, you know, if you're a knight in 5e or a warrior or you have these kind of specific areas, you do have to give them some niche protection in, a, in an RPG. You do have to make it worth you know, deliberately picking one over another. Whereas with the deprived, you can just kind of have them do whatever you want. So they get to pick, you know, at certain, you, you get, you, it's still going to be a lot harder for you, but you are going to get to pick any class item or feat you want. Yeah, and, and you've set it up so that, you know, each of the classes kind of has like two strong points, elements, whatever you want to call them, such as, you know, the cleric, uh, miraculous, and, you know, un unbowed. And then um, for the sorcerer, you know, magic and protection. And those really are, like, the key elements of, like, you know, what are each of those classes? Power and life of the pyromancer. And then, you know, of course, like, as you've just described very well for the deprived, freedom and choice. Mm. Um, you know, you don't have a lot to contribute when you start out. But the one thing that you do have that no one can take away from you is that that freedom. You can become anything. You're a blank slate as the deprived. And, um, you know, what does that mean for you? I mean, it could mean many things. I mean, you know, it could easily just mean that you die over and over and over and over again without Definitely. really getting the chance to develop much into yourselves. You came back and you didn't have anything. You had no memories, no possessions, no... Do you, you know, make it far enough in your life, in your progress to gain some of that? Or do you just die, come back again with, once again, no memories and no possessions? Like, that constant, like, um, Groundhog Day? Is that the movie? Yeah. <laughs> but, like, the worst kind. You wake up and you're like, the worst kind of Groundhog. you're like, I, I, I got nothing, I, I got no one, nothing to clue me in. Alexander Ward played um, the deprived in a in a game I, I ran for Good Time Society on Friday, and uh, I did have a good time killing his character and then making it so he didn't wake up with any of his new armor he'd just stolen. Uh, so he was completely back, <laughs> completely back to the start. Um, it was it was cruel, but it was again um, true to that's form. What you from the deprived, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm just so excited, I'm just gonna smack my microphone. Sorry to anyone who just heard that. Um, but yeah, yeah, exactly. There's this, there's, there's just, you know, that is such a, I don't know, quintessential part of it. Like, you know, the, the deprived is one of those things where like, you don't see it in very many games where like, there's literally the option to be like, I don't know, a shell of a person. What could you be? Limitless possibilities. What were you? <laughs> Limitless possibilities. But do you retain any of that? No. Whatever you were before, not helpful in the least. <laughs> well, we did. I, I, so that was that. I think that's one of the the key and, and most interesting elements of of what you can do in a Dark Souls tabletop RPG is that while you know the 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 chosen undead or the the unkindled in in the first and third games have um, no background, you you know nothing about them. It, the game was an opportunity to allow people to build a little more into the kind of people they wanted to be. So um, there is, you know, when, when you're generating a character, the first thing you do is come up with 
um, your your kind of last memory, um, your your motivation. Why why do you keep you know g- given that you're being killed and reanimated <laughs> again and again and again? What keeps you getting up from the bonfire and, and journeying into the darkness? And then um, you know maybe one one idea of who you were. And that's, you know, it's not, a, there's not a lot of detail there. There's just this little kind of fragment, this half memory of who you used to be. Remember and that's kind of, that I had a family. What do I know about them? I don't know, but I just, I just feel like I had people, you know, they were my people. Hmm. And that's why, I, that's why I'm going back into the dark. I'm trying to figure out more about them, where to find them. What can I get to them? Are they dead too? And I think I think that's a really powerful element of of you know you're chosen, but almost nobody else in this world is, and nearly everybody else in in, the, in Dark Souls is a, a husk. Mm-hmm. They have you know they're they're they they all their humanity is gone. There's nothing left of them. They're hollows. I think you know being s- sentient and 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 you know possessing kind of any degree of emotion or. or choice in 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 that in that setting is is really interesting i think the i think the existential questions of dark souls are one of the things that's not often touched upon when when people are thinking and talking about it so often the the tactical combat is so often you know the kind of the meme memeable moments you know praise the sun and all that sort of stuff which is you know again that's a huge part of Dark Souls identity, but there is an awful lot beneath the surface, and I it was like philosophical. Hope, yeah, exactly, and I, I, I hope we got. I, you know, obviously, there's only so much you can do in a in a in a 500 page rule book where the rules <laughs> have to be the main thing. But um, 508 <laughs> pages. 508 pages. Good God. <laughs> which which I opened the uh this Y hander one earlier. 662. So you're doing all right. Oh, like... you kidding? Yeah. Right, well, the next rule book is going to be 700 pages. <laughs> Daniel Fox has started a fight he can't finish. Thing. All right. Maybe we'll get items next, everybody. What kind of items do you get in Dark Souls? <laughs> more, more. I, I am ne- there's no way I'm ever writing another item for Dark Souls. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> that chapter is 100 pages long and it nearly killed me. Good news. You can freelance it. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Even though having done it myself, I feel bad about asking anybody else to do it. Yeah. I feel tremendously guilty about inflicting that chapter on anybody. Maybe I have to split it between about 20 people <laughs> just to, <laughs> to try and keep them safe. Oh, uh, well, you know, we'll get, we'll get, um, you know, I don't know. Maybe just a lore guide. As it, you know, I don't know. I don't know. There's so much you could add here. Um, but you've got 508 pages, which is more than enough to start. Um, and like you said, we do hit on a lot of those philosophical things. Like, I like that, you know, right in the very beginning, in the character generation section, you talk about, you know, what are the unkindled, which are what everyone is. Everyone. All the player characters are the unkindled. You were dead. And now you're not. Why? How? What is your purpose here? You know, you you can... You know, what, what brought you here? Why? What forces you time and time again to get up, to go from the bonfire, grab your weapon, then go out there? Like, I mean, and that in and of itself is the central story of Dark Souls. Like, what is the motivating force? Like, why do you get up over and over again and go from the bonfire out to fight these the hollows, these forces that are out there? Like, and everyone's going to have to develop that story for themselves. And that's what I'm most looking forward to hearing from people. Like, their stories, their back, their backstories that they come up with. Because that's going to be, like, what drives these games. These are going to be... I mean, everyone's like, oh, yes, combat, combat, combat. No, these are going to be story-driven campaigns. I do, I do hope so. Because I, th- I, I think that's one of the great things about TTRPGs and one of the difficulties is that you know if you don't want to get up from the bonfire on Dark Souls the computer game well you can't play the game and you have to turn it off that's you've done whereas in a, in a TTRPG you know it's, it's everybody knows the nightmare players who go well why am I doing this 
And, you know, to, to a certain extent, that's a reasonable question. In a world where there is virtually, what, what are you fighting for? In a world where kind of everything is 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 and, crumbling. And, you know, you tell me, why are you doing this? If your character that you're playing right now can't think of a reason to carry on, maybe you make a new character who can't think of a reason. Yeah. But that's why I, I thought we had to have, we had to have motivations. We had to have something some reason to do something and it was it was alan barr who did um the the development editing pass um uh, amazing game designer who, who who said you know you you need to tie you need to make these mechanical you need an incentive to make people keep these for you know at the, the forefront of their mind so they're also they do give you mechanical benefits as well if you in you know draw on one of these things you gain re-rolls you gain advantage on saves or checks it's about, you know, so to, to keep them at the forefront of players' minds and to keep them using them um, and, and being aware of them. So that the story, as you say, the, the, the core story of each individual in Dark Souls doesn't get lost. It's always there. It's always a part of you. Yeah, and those those things, that's uh, your your backstories, your memories, your character drives, like all of those things, like you said. The, the built-in, the inherent mechanical, you know, motivation there to use these things, to uh, connect to these things, to make them central and core to who you are. Like, that, that's brilliant. I wish that was something that was in the core <laughs> by the game. I, because yeah, I mean... the number of times people are just like, Ah, the personality traits and all those tables. Ah, I'll do those later. They never do them. And by they never do no. them, I mean I never do them. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Also, I mean, but that's you know. the, the background. The, you know, five E has has many strengths, but the backgrounds are essentially useless, really. They the, they they are they feel very much like a, a role playing afterthought. Yeah, the backgrounds themselves, like the the core idea of the background, like, okay, I was a smuggler. All right, great. So smuggler, so I could be, you know, um, like, uh, you know, what's his face from Game of Thrones, where like that was a very big thing, big part of his backstory. He smuggled in the onions, kept the whole thing city alive. But then, like, what's my personality? What does it have to do with being a smuggler? Nothing, nothing. Why is that in this section? This should be separate. Yeah. And there should be, you know, uh, like many other games do, like if I stay true to my personality that I've written down, like if I'm using my, you know, my bond of like, I'm doing all of this, you know, in honor of my mother who was always passionate about saving orphans, and I save every child that I can see who I just saw their parents slain, I should get some sort of incentive for doing that and being true to my bond. But I don't, unless your DM no, remembers no. your bond. Which exactly. they don't. They don't. Exactly. They don't. Unless you put it in like a neon sign on your forehead, your DM forgot your bond. And I think, you know, it's it's interesting because people, if you write, people who write, you know, backstory for their characters, they always remember that. Oh, yeah. They know, they know, you know, they know chapter and verse and they can tell you, you know, oh, well, this is, you know, this is um, difficult for my character because of X or, you know. My, my character's dad was Y, so I, I really should, you know, know about this. Whereas the backgrounds, they're so generic and, you know, so kind of for forgettable, really, that, that people don't use them when actually they're, they're the kind of thing that should be at the, at the center of a character. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I love, like, how that has been encapsulated here, that whole feeling of, like, Note what you did before is very important because it is going to shape and mold who you are and why you're doing this. Um, and you know, you've even got in, you know, examples here for like how to do all of this stuff. And so, um, yes, kudos to the, the editor then who was like, nope, this must be mechanical, otherwise, we're never going to use it. Alan, yeah, he's a... <laughs> yeah, Alan, yes. Yes. Alan Barr, man's a, a, a great designer. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, that's one thing that's different from 5e, and I think that's crucial as far as, like, this being a story-driven campaign. Obviously, some other things that people have been, um, I don't know, anxious about seeing um, changes or about lack of changes that actually are changes here um, are going to be things like uh, the magic system. Because you're you're not wandering around in Dark Souls and being like, oh, found a spell book. Let me see how many spells it's got. 
Oh, let's see. Oh, I get to, I get to cast teleportation now. I know it. Learned it just now. Like, that's not a thing. You don't do that in Dark Souls. You don't just stumble into a list of spells. I, so, I mean, I, I, I hate D&D magic. <laughs> I, I, I hate that system. I hate that D and D is a is a, a game with twenty levels, but spells go from levels one to nine, and there is almost no intersection between those two things. So, um, fortunately, I was in a position to just get rid of that because Dark Souls magic is very different, and so I could just basically cut it all out and, and start again. And and I hope so. That the system we've got is it's, it's basically straight from dark souls so in dark souls you know you have a number of attunement slots that's not attunement like it is in 5e with you know connecting to your magic items etc it's literally how many spells you can have uh, mm -hmm. and and a more powerful use. spell takes more attunement slots exactly um, i might um, have used a different word because of confusion but you know it, it, they're called I, yeah I, I i it's a very fair point but <laughs> It was, I, I chose, basically decided I'll stick with the Dark Souls terminology um, because I'm more scared of Dark Souls fans than D&D &D fans. Which um, is valid, is, which is valid. Like, you know, they, that, that is a passionate community. Yes. And, uh, and I am a coward uh, <laughs> when it comes to annoying, alienating communities. So, so we use that. And then each spell has a number of casts. And it's very simple. You, like, when you've cast a spell, you tick off one of those casts. Mm -hmm. You only get to recharge them um, when you go to a, to a bonfire, uh, to long rest. Because, you know, uh, Cal Surprise, you can only uh, long rest at a bonfire in, in, in Dark Souls. Um, in Dark Souls, the role-playing game, that is. So you just you just tick them off and you cast them. Some of them, you know, and, and then as with D&D spells, some of them you have to roll to hit, some of them you don't. So then have damage. The damage can be increased by spending position, which I realize we've not really talked about. No, we, 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 can go, we can go back. Let's go back. Let's, Should we go back? Pause, we, okay. Yeah, pause magic. Let's go back to position. <laughs> You're right. That's important. We got to start okay. with that. So position is a new thing that's been added in that wasn't in 5e before, but which really makes the, makes it feel more like Dark Souls because you have to you earn position, spin position. What is what is position for people who are like so. So obviously, Dark Souls kind of has two um, two axes that you're constantly policing uh, when you're controlling your character. One is health, which you know everybody gets that. It's your, your hit points, is how how many more hits you can take until you die. And the other one is stamina. Stamina is consumed by by attacking, by uh, mm -hmm. defending, by rolling. Whatever you're doing takes up certain amounts of stamina. So if you're doing a big heavy attack, that takes up more stamina than a light attack. So we considered bringing in a a separate uh, stamina measurement. You know, there was kind of an idea of that being a pool. And then um, at, at one point, I pitched that you could spend initiative. Um, and the idea was that you would roll initiative at the start of a fight. And when you wanted to use your big attacks, you could spend that. And in the end, we kind of came up with um, what we what we've called position. And that is a a an amalgam of your your hit points and uh this idea of stamina so what happens is you have a base position and then at the start of each fight you roll uh, essentially uh, a hit die mm -hmm. it kind of works in that same way you add that to your base position and that becomes your position pool for the fight you can spend position to do loads of different things you can use it to um unlock certain features that you know class features or you can charge those up Every weapon has a position spend, allowing you to use a particular skill, either to do more damage or, you know, to let out a war cry to stun your opponent or just dodge away 10, you know, 10 feet without incurring a, an attack of opportunity. There's, you can spend it to increase your, your dice. So you can spend it on a one-to-one -one basis there. If you think you're really close to killing a creature, you could spend five position to do five damage. You, there's loads of different options and um, to kind of come back to the spells most spells have the ability to upgrade damage or increase the length of an effect or the area of an effect by spending position of course the concomitant of that is the more of that you spend the closer you push yourself to death right and that's the, that's that's why we did it because i mean if you burn through all your stamina on dark souls 
you're basically left standing there while an enemy smacks you. And you and only so really you need to be smacked once at that point. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's the right it's the right attack, and you've mistimed it, and you're vulnerable and now in the open. You very likely to be one shotted. So that's kind of what we've we've captured uh, in Dark Souls, uh, or I hope with with position. I uh, loved it. it. It really encapsulated uh, taking you know what in D and D is where you're 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 very hard to kill. It's very difficult to kill you. And that's meant to be because you're you're the hero, uh, versus in Dark Souls you're the reluctant hero. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it, and it's meant to be difficult. So taking in, kind of rolling all that in, you've got your base position because you can use it out of combat. And then as you go into combat, you get you gain a little bit more because you've just you've got the adrenaline. And you know, and but and you can you can you can you know. All this, or you can just like you know, real combat, you can make a big, heavy, hard hitting attack, but like that takes it out of you. And then mm. after after that, you got to take some time for a breather. And while you're taking a breather, what are you? You're vulnerable. It's very real and true to life. And I I I loved how positioning was set up, and especially how it did not take more than two pages with a lot of white space to fully explain it, and me to just be like. Ah, yes, no, I completely understand what we're doing here. And then as we yeah, went on, you know, seeing examples of how we're using it, but you like there's it's very clear. Thank you. That yeah, it took a uh I imagine a couple you know, of a couple of tries. A <laughs> couple of tries and some really, you know, good editing advice from uh some very, very talented editors. Um but yeah, I, we're we're very proud of of those rules, I think, yeah, like you say, they, they are, I think they, they do click quite quickly with people. It's, it's quite, and it's, it's cool. You know, it is cool it to is. be able to, I, people do definitely, what I particularly like about it as a, uh, it, you know, is people do get carried away the first couple of times. And you're like, oh, I'm just going to burn it. I'm just going to burn it. I yeah. want this to be really cool. And then you're like, I have made a mistake. Because by the time, yeah, you get a little, like you say, you get a little boost for the fight, for the pool. But it's really, it's quite, it's very easy to be one-shotted if you're not very, very careful. Um, and also, one of the things that I particularly like about base uh, position is it keeps traps interesting. <laughs> because, let's be honest, in 5e, traps are really dangerous till about third level. And okay. then either, oh. then either traps, you have to scale up the damage of a trap ludicrously. Or drastically increase the complexity of it. It's no longer a simple yes. trap. It's got multiple layers to it, like an ogre. Yeah. yeah, you have to either. Yeah, you have to. You have to either do Grimtooth's uh, traps things. You know, with like fifteen different pulleys, all of which are dropping <laughs> hundreds of weights tipped with poison darts on the end, and you know, or you know, things like pit traps and swinging axes just stop being a problem. I think you know, and that's one of the great problems with Five A is that. You very quickly and and possibly you know three as well. You you become pretty godlike really by the tenth level. Almost nothing is going to touch you by tenth mm, level, no, except for huge creatures. Yeah, by the time you're up to tier three, you have to get very very creative with the trap making, um, as evidenced by an adventure I wrote where every single room in a house had a trap, and only about a quarter of those were the players like the others. They were like. Oh, was that a trap? Oh gosh, <laughs> uh, I just found it with my face and didn't even realize. <laughs> yeah, when you can when you can start kind of searching for traps by just, <laughs> as you say, walking into them with your face. But when the illusory dragon dropped in the house, I've got to have a party who wasn't like, oh, fuck. Nice. We were, <laughs> I like that. And I'm like. Well, I mean, everything was going well. You guys were all doing great. And then you're like, I really got to have this dragon scale shield. You take it down. And then you're like, where'd this dragon come from? Because nobody's thinking. Oh, it's nice. an illusion. You're all like, touch the dragon scale, summon the dragon. Oh, shit. we're about to die. Um, I wish I could take all the credit for that because it was great. It's grand. Um, but you have to really, you know, get creative and outside the box and it's no longer just your physical traps. So, you know, having, yeah, have something like this would make it so much easier <laughs> to just yeah. be like, just be like, yeah. there's a pit. What do you do? It's full of snakes. Regular snakes? No. No, obviously not. <laughs> Poisonous snakes of the worst kind. Poisonous snakes that when you step on the thing, they become flying snakes. 
Wow. Nice. Magic. Magic snakes. <laughs> don't question. It's just magic. Magic. We don't question how you can cast fireball. It's D and D. Is it not? It's magic. D and D. Yeah. Um, but now traps with positioning traps are a thing. Like you, you, you don't want to come across like a a spike filled chasm that you are not absolutely certain you can jump. No, exactly, and that's <laughs> that's you know Dark Souls. Yeah, obviously Dark Souls gets more difficult as you go through it, and the monsters get higher hit points. But you are always, always vulnerable. You know the 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 number of stories of people who have you know leveled up in Dark Souls and kind of think they've they've got the hang of it, and then bang, they're they're hit with something they didn't see coming, and they don't have any means of dealing with. And that's that's what position I think allows us to capture. Um, in, in I hope I hope it's still fun, but it's it's definitely brutal. I think it's fun. I I thought it was great fun. Alan thinks it's fun, and we can't both be wrong. Sure. <laughs> no, see, the odds odds are definitely against it. <laughs> yeah. Um. But back to magic then, since that tied into magic. So we've got the magic system where um you can scale up with position. Um, but you know, also you're not just finding spell books as we started out. No, I mean, you do have to find spells and you do have to, you can buy them, but that's, that's dealt with in the GM's chapter. And also spells are, you know, they are leveled based on your character level. You know, if it says level 20, it's because you need to be level 20 before you can cast that spell. Uh, if you want to be level, you know, if you have to be level 11 before you can get that spell. Right. Um, and that's that's partly because you know there's even in even in Dark Souls, um, wizard uh, sorcery magic is going to be very powerful. So you have to kind of you know you have to stop the the the, the quadratic wizards linear fighters thing. Um, but but also because it's a you know it's a, a lot easier than levels one to nine for spells, but levels one to twenty for everything else. I know. Which is still still don't get still don't get. <laughs> I don't, I mean, we could go way back to the beginning of D&D &D where that problem began. Yeah. I and mean, it I still, can... and it still won't make sense. No, I mean, it's a, it's a bodge, it's a bodge job. But then <laughs> I just don't understand why it's persisted, you know, because I mean, I get, I get why Vancey and Magic stuck around because it's, it's a core element, you know, fire and forget. Everybody knows that. But why spells can't be divided on a one to 20 level? I don't know. I, I don't get it. I mean, and you know, and then there's classes like the poor uh, paladin and whatnot, where like you don't even get the whole thing. Yeah, you don't even get close. Yeah. yeah. But then, like, let like wish. If you put t wish at le as level twenty, then then you save a lot of headaches. <laughs> you know, uh, people are no longer just wishing away the big bad or things like that. All right. Giving well. Themselves I'd like to let you know, no one in any of my games is wishing away the big bad, so if you're seeing this, well, don't, I mean, get, any, know, don't get any ideas, it won't happen. <laughs> <laughs> I like the fact you're giving them, like, a, a rep teacher reprimand, yeah. <laughs> yes, no, it shan't happen. <laughs> um, your wish will go horribly awry, uh, which is the thing that not, not enough DMs take into consideration that it specifically says there, you can wish outside the box if you want, but there's no guarantee. Um, yes. But yeah, so you know we've got the the spell attunements. Um, you have to equip it in your attunement slot, so which you must have the requ requisite number. You've got your casting level, which is the same level you have to be, and the number of times you can cast it. Like that's pretty straightforward. Spells still have casting times, immediate bonus yeah. reaction, like so, and all of that. Everything makes sense. Range shapes. Um, you can still argue with your DM. Over a cone, which squares does it hit? <laughs> Don't worry, we're not taking. Nobody's taking that away from you. But then, my, sorry, yeah, I was yeah. going to say one of my favorite bits of layout in the book is is the shapes for those all have a little icon of the shape above them, um, <laughs> and it just it just makes you very happy. <laughs> it's a weird weird little thing that you get when you spend a long time working on the book. That the things the things you start to like really appreciate are kind of tiny details, which. People might not notice, but I love I love those little icons. Oh yeah. So they do. Huh. I hadn't noticed that previously. I like that too. I think you have to have spent about 150 hours <laughs> just trawling through those pages and still missing typos. Um but 
I've only I've still only found the one, and it's not really a typo. It's a it's a choice. It was a stylistic choice. Thank you. Uh, that's good. But yeah, we've we, I I found some, and you know they. Well, I have oh, I have I have read it like line by line. Yeah, I'm gonna. It's 508 pages, Richard. Yeah, yeah, you've got you've got a bit of time left. I'll I'll let you off. Uh, but yeah, so you know you've got all the spells here. Um, they're not your 5e spells, obviously. They're Dark Souls spells. Um, you know, um, and they they have their varying levels. You can get, um, you know, so, well, you know, take for instance your your fire spells. So you know, fireball. You can get a level one fireball. Uh, it's you know small you can get a level five fire orb it's you know significant you can get a great fireball level 12 you can get a great chaos fireball which is exactly what that's going to be mass chaos but you know you don't get those things until you're the level where you can handle it um because if you're level one trying to cast a great chaos fireball it's nothing but chaos it's all chaos you die everyone the, dies it's chaos. It's just magic gone awry. No one, you can't handle it. You can't do it. Um, so they scale, you know, very well. You have what you can handle at the level you can handle, which really makes me, um, you know, obviously reminds me of Dark Souls, but, you know, that too. It, you know, with Diablo, you get your, your progressions as you go. Your spells grow with you. You add runes onto them to make them do mm. new things as you grow and like that's one of the things that you love about adventures and stories like this you start out the monsters are small and you're like okay these spells are doing it you get bigger and you're like i'm gonna need more firepower and then you're like ah oh, i found it more firepower and then you're like whoa this is gonna take out anything i can come to and you're really self-assured for i don't know a level and a half and then you're like this is no longer doing it <laughs> i need a new trick and you were constantly having to search and go out there to find the thing, because otherwise you find if you become complacent, you become dead. Very quickly. Yes. Very quickly. Um, and then you end up with a bonfire again, and you have to sit there and think about your life choices and how did I become <laughs> dead? Okay. Definitely. Yeah. Well, that's that's the um, that's the thing I think, especially it's it's also the thing with dying. So the, the death rules are, are quite harsh. You know, you if half the party dies... You're all dead. You it's fail. done. Yeah. Uh, and that brings you, I think... I think that forces the party to work together. You Absolutely. Know, you can't just... Yeah. Um, and, and think as a unit rather than, oh, well, it doesn't matter if, you know, I act like an idiot because, um, you know, we'll get away with it or, or, the, or the wizard will finish it off or something like that. Yeah. You have to think about... Mm -hmm. yeah. And it helps you, you know, um, realize that you are a, a unit. You're not, you know, individual hero and sidekicks, nor are you, you know, I don't, I don't know, any other combination of that. You are all equally important and you've really got to, you've got to plot, you've got to plan, you've got to strategize together um, because, you know, if one person is failing over and over again, then you all need to sit down at the bonfire and be like, all right, what have you been doing? Because it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. It brings it brings the party together. And I think, in, in hopefully in a way, because as you say, Dark Souls is usually a single player experience. You can have, there are multiplayer aspects in there. You know, you can summon people to help you and stuff like that. But they're, they're usually temporary. Mm -hmm. So as you say, this is a way of making everybody contingent on everybody else you know you you have to rely on each other in a way that hopefully makes it feel like like you say you are one unit working together not a series of people who can all just do everything right yeah C certainly because you you can't it's like you can't be the sole hero it's just not 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 a not a thing um, you're contending with forces far larger than yourself, and you know the the world will outpace you quickly. Hmm. So you gotta, you know, you don't have to be the most balanced party. That's not a thing. Like nobody cares party balance, but you you need to be a party that is cohesive. Yes, definitely. Um, because you know you're gonna have to think together. Like, okay. If I, you know, somebody somewhere is probably going to need to take something that's some kind of utility. 
well, I mean, yeah, the, the Herald is definitely your, I think that the main utility class here is that they're pretty rugged in combat, but they also have access to magic. But then the, the weird thing about Dark Souls, py the Pyromancer, I mean, it doesn't have any healing, but the Pyromancer is pretty hard in combat and mm -hmm. can fire off great Chaos Fireballs. So there's, there's, there's a lot of ways 17. of mixing. Yes. Well, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> it's going to take you a while to get there, but you can get there. <laughs> so it does, it does take um, thought, but you, it, it's not just a case of, you know, if you are, I don't know, if you're the cleric, you're the healer. Mm -hmm. Although kind of you are, but you're also you can also do a lot more. The miracles are pretty useful. Mm -hmm. the, the miracles are very useful, and then and then of course too, you know, outside of just magical capabilities, you've all got your um, your equipment. The you know your your favorite chapter, um, <laughs> where yeah. you have to consider, you know, what does each person take? How does that help the party? How does that hinder the party? Because <laughs> sometimes you're going to take something where you really need it, but like honestly, it doesn't help the rest of your friends but not having it is severely detrimental to you yourself so like you gotta make those choices um and um i just love how this is laid out it makes me want to it makes me want to print them out and cut them out like little cards but then i <laughs> well uh that 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 was definitely so elliot, elliot smith is the is the name of the amazing graphic artist who did uh and and designer who did uh, all the layout and that's that's definitely what he was going for um yeah, to, to kind of capture that feeling of, of almost like mixing and matching and like a trading card game. Of, yep. Because that's that's definitely how you how you individuate your, your character, how you make them. It is everybody can wear everything as long as you basically have the right strength attribute. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you can be a wizard in full plate mail. Um, yes, a sorcerer, rather, in full plate mail. Yeah. Um, you, you can, yes. And you have you know, all kinds of stuff, beautiful, and not only can you have it, but you can immediately conceptualize in your brain what it looks like when you're wearing it, because for the armors and stuff, there are beautiful renderings here. Um, they're just little invisible people wearing them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, because uh, that's obviously d d kind of, you know, conflates all the you know you don't have individual parts of an armor so we kind of went with right so every set is a set rather than individual pieces so yeah we've got <laughs> little invisible mannequins floating I, in the air wearing everything i love little invisible mannequins though it, it, they bring yeah. me great joy who's wearing this you could be <laughs> imagine you yourself here yes. um yeah and you know appreciate the 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 variety and everything and the armor that is very you know true to form and also for people who've only played traditional D, &D uh are going to be a bit overwhelming uh, yeah yeah i mean everybody does have a, a starting equipment and starting um items so you know you can you can do it gradually and there's there's tips on um introducing the new equipment to players so you're not going to have that case of them just you know you're go to a market and here's everything yeah. <laughs> here's everything you could ever dream of just throw gold at it um and also you have to, you have to buy it with souls of course that means that's directly coming out of your experience pool um which makes um buying new stuff a another balancing act, a risky know? proposition a, exactly an extremely risky proposition um is it worth it for me to get a shield right now or should I wait till I get another hundred souls? And that's half the cost of it. So, like, or do I want to just, like, go negative 200? Well, not negative. You can't go negative. But, you know, it's just like, oh, gosh, I don't know. Because, you know, your experience pool. Yeah. And, th th and that's the kind of, those are the kind of, those are the questions and, and thoughts I wanted to put in players' head. I wanted them to be constantly um, uncertain basically about what the right thing to do is because i think that's definitely a, a dark soulsy you know element do is it worth me going through on this little side quest is it worth me uh you know talking to this npc is it worth me seeing if i can take out a mini boss or you know um just skipping them if i can 
and the, the questions about what the right action is, I think, are are invaluable to um, creating both, you know, a, a Dark Souls, an authentic Dark Souls experience, and just a fun gaming uh, setting. So I want to go back a second to souls, because that's a very important element that we touched on there, but that we didn't really cover. So souls, obviously very important in the Dark Souls game. You collect your souls when you kill your enemies, and they determine how fast you level up. Yep. So if you're spending your souls, you're potentially losing your levels. And, you know, you have to take that into consideration when you've got your spells that you need to be 5th level to cast this spell, but if I buy this shield, I'll only be 4th level. And, yeah, and if, I mean, you can you can bank souls, obviously once they're spent, they're spent. But, yeah, judging how, when you level up, or do you equip yourself? I Is it better to be, say, taking on this, this boss when you're all 5th level? Or is it better to have bought equipment which gives you an edge against this boss? So, you know, for instance, certain shields might, you know, give you resistance to lightning damage. Mm -hmm. And if you're facing, say, um, the the Nameless King on his Storm Drake, where Ooh, lightning is yeah. a huge part of the battle, you, you're going to want that shield. But And oh, by the way, don't take on the, the Nameless King at, at, at level five. No, I do not recommend. No. <laughs> Much but, higher level. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> for the sake of argument... <laughs> <laughs> is it better to be that higher level and get the new um the new uh spell feature yeah or spell or is it better to have the shield that gives you this this little boost i don't know uh although i think actually def definitely level up in that case because otherwise you, you know but um <laughs> making sure you've got equipment available and maximizing the the, the usefulness and utility of the equipment you're carrying because encumbrance is done quite differently in the game it's based on a series of slots and the the minimum strength requirement of a set of armor is basically attri attributable to how heavy the armor is will tell you how many slots it takes up so you can only carry a certain number of uh, suits of armor certain level of equipment at any one time which makes the choices again that much more difficult and that much more important when you're trying to stay alive Yes, so 15, 15 slots and, you know, the, the five classic ones. You got your headpiece, your handpiece, or not your headpiece, your, your armor piece. I do like the idea of them having a headpiece, though. <laughs> I, yeah, no, I like that, too. I, I like that, too, in some games. You, you get your headpiece, you get your, your, your neck piece, your shoulders, each arm, your rings, your weapons, your boots, your pants, your belt. Um, simplified, obviously, a little here. You got your armor, your rings, your weapons. One weapon, two weapon, or one weapon, uh, yeah. as the case may be. Um, and you know, you can you can have some backups, you can have some options, but you can't just stockpile stuff. You have to get rid of it at a certain point in time, and which makes sense. At a certain point in time, like I'm sorry, that armor that you got back at level two, it's not it's not useful. It's never you're never gonna wear it again. Yeah. <laughs> Get rid of it. Yeah, get rid of it. Exactly. Um, but yeah. All right. We are running out of time. Are there any other things that are new or changes that we definitely want to hit on before we wrap this up? I think uh, I think the only thing to, to mention is that um, kind of so that we, we have the bloody the bloodied condition from yes. 4 e is back. We brought that in because um, we're big fans of 4 e at, at Steamforged. I mean, uh, all right, so it's technically in 5th edition. It's just not called that. It's called something different, but whatever. It's fine. Okay. Well, anything, anything. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> don't, please don't get your reprimanding stick out. No, um, that, that's me <laughs> to all my, that's me to all my, all, all the other DMs who play at my tables who try to backseat DM. There's no such thing as bloody. And I'll be like, actually, if you would like to look in the player's handbook. <laughs> Well, I am. I am sorry. I, no, I, you're I fine. You're fine. Um, but no, um, bringing back that terminology—that's that's, that's uh, well understood, even by fifth edition players, <laughs> because it's better. I think it's such a. It's it's so much better terminology. It is. It's such a cool rule. I mean, I, you know, four uh, E is is a really great game in many ways, and it had such a good yeah. design team. And um, and you know, 
bloodied for those of you who don't know and who I, whom I interrupted the description oh. for is something that happens um, when you're below half hit points. So you get the bloodied condition and in some cases that takes you into, um, you know, you or the monster into a bit of a frenzy where you gain um, a new ability because, you know, you've got that adrenaline kick or whatever. Um, and you just all of a sudden, like, now that you're bloodied, you have this extra thing you can do. Um, but um, that bit doesn't exist in 5th edition. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, and, and then also... So also a lot of, not all, every monster, but a lot of monsters have that. And then every boss monster, every boss oh, creature yeah. can spend position like a player character. So that, you know, if you're fighting, and I mean, you know, I think Yorm the Giant has something like 700 hit points and the Solar Cinder has 900 hit points. So they're, they're going to hit you every time because they will happily just spend position to hit you. Uh, so you are going to have to be... It makes every fight that much more challenging. <laughs> You're going to spend that a lot of time at the bonfire considering how to kill them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, but I mean, if once you're, once you're sort of, you know, level 20 um, or, you know, even close to that, you should, you, you should be able to, to take them down. But it's going to be tough because you can't rely on um, people, you know, you can't really rely on bad rolls to save you. Um, you you're just going to get hit. Right. And, and, you know, that's, that's, kind of how it is sometimes yeah yeah very very dark souls uh, yeah. I, I hope I, that's what that's what we were always you know trying for and how can we make this feel more like dark souls how can we make this nastier basically is, is the way balanced but nastier mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know i think i think you did a great job overall so um i can't wait for um uh, game it's available for pre-order now you can you yep, can go at on the, the steamforge.com or steamforge.co.uk um there's a a live uh, pre-order for both the standard and the very posh gilt edged don't forget the gilt edges uh, collector's edition if you want to be a little um, bit extra you can just go ahead and just get that one extra. yeah yeah <laughs> oh, it is, not, it is definitely... pay, no, i mean yes pay a little, but you know be be extra <laughs> well be extra pay extra pay extra to be extra it's uh, often 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 the way there's an unfortunate <laughs> uh, equation there, but yeah, that's um, true. More sparkles equals more money. Yeah, that is I, that's what I found anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for um coming on today and chatting about this. I know I'm super I'm super excited to see it come out. Um, I think I'm going to be running some sessions of this at GaryCon. Uh, so if you're at GaryCon, um come find me and annoy me with some questions about it but mostly find richard and annoy him because he <laughs> yeah, has more I answers will. um but uh yeah no i am i can't wait to see what people make this um it is it's a great game it's been you know very well put together and so um i hope that once people have it in their little pause that they change their tune on twitter oh, i well. don't have a lot of optimism for twitter but I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna believe anyways. Um, but yeah, um, that said, um, Richard, where can everyone find you um, and Steam Forge online if they want to check out more of your other stuff? I can be found on, on Facebook and on Twitter at, uh, at RPG August and Steam Forge, steamforge.com or .co.uk and then at Steam Forge LTD on Twitter. All right, that is pretty easy. All right, and as always, everyone, you can find me at Jenny Love Day on all the things, including the YouTube. Um, I've still got like 11 months to be excited about that, finally getting it fixed. Yeah, I, it was an accomplishment. Um, but yeah, so I have uh, some exciting guests lined up. Um, I naturally do not have my calendar open because i've never prepared for this um but uh stay tuned um for the rest of march um we're gonna have some really great people on the show talking to them about their stuff there's just a lot of really good content coming out this spring and i'm excited to talk to everyone about that and if you've got anything that you want to come on and talk about um just hit me up on twitter or shoot me an email it's in my bio on twitter and i'd love to chat with you um but until then, that is it for this episode of the Designer's Den. Thanks, everyone, and thanks, Richard. Thanks for having me.